Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab talk series. I'm delighted that today we have Catherine Wantlin presenting Leveraging Unlabeled Data to Predict Out of Distribution Performance. Looking forward to your talk, talk Catherine, take it away. Great, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Catherine. Um, I joined the lab um, this past fall. I'm currently doing my master's in CS um, at Princeton. Excited to present this paper. Um, so to start with just some problem background, um, we're very familiar um, in ML um, with you know drawing these IID samples from a source distribution um, to make up a training and validation set. Um, and then we often, though, face in practice this problem that when we shift to uh, doing uh, inference and test time, um, the data is coming from this target distribution um, that might not be exactly the same as the distribution that we trained on. Um, so the goal of this paper um, is to present a lot of theoretical results, um, but not necessarily to um, help to improve a classifier per se, but just to estimate the accuracy of a given classifier um, on a target distribution. Um, so just to highlight some related methods, um, previous methods um, have utilized things like calibration on the target domain um, with additional labels, um, or they have made some assumptions um, about uh, sort of linear relationship between um, the, the target uh, domain distributional distance with the source domain. Um, however, um, in this paper, we kind of um, do away with sort of these assumptions um, and essentially say that we can assume we have uh, labeled source data, um, X and Y, for training and validation, um, but we only have access to unlabeled target data. Um, so the process generally goes that we train a model um, um, with the training data, um, to output uh, certain uh, softmax scores, certain logits. Um, and then we move over to validation time. Um, and there we feed those logits into a score function um, and then view sort of the distribution of those scores um, for our validation data. Um, and the goal at validation time is to learn a threshold such that the fraction of samples with a score above the threshold um, matches the accuracy um, in a multi-class classification setting. Um, and then at target time, we basically have this threshold that we tuned at validation time. Um, we have the score function and we have the classifier. Um, so we're able to generate, again, a distribution of scores. Um, and then we say, you know, with this threshold that we've already tuned, we predict accuracy at test time as the fraction of unlabeled target samples with a score above this threshold. Um, so this paper um, presents uh, sort of this method. Um, and tries to give some theoretical justifications of when it does work and when it doesn't work. Um, so I'll first highlight sort of the important notation um, and then go through like at a very high level some of the um, theoretical guarantees that they present in this paper. Um, so again, we're working with multi-class classification. Um, we assume we have an input domain um, of some d-dimensional vectors um, and a label space of some k classes. Um, and then we assume that these X and Y pairs are coming from source and target distributions um, where there might be some shift between them. Um, and then we say that for a given data point, that the error on that data point um, with its uh, label Y um, is one if um, the predicted label, this arg max over the soft max scores is not equal to the true label. Um, otherwise it's zero, we can generalize this um, error to uh, sets of data um, by taking an expectation um, over the distribution of X and Ys. Um, so again, uh, this, this uh, setup assumes that we use a fixed model. Um, we have labeled training and validation data from the source distribution DS and then unlabeled data from DT. Um, and then the goal is just to predict target classification error. Um, so to start, um, there are a, like a variety of methods that have been um, suggested in the literature. Um, so these theoretical results just try to gauge, um, you know, what are the bounds of, of how good can we can we predict accuracy on the target? Um, are we always going to be able to predict this very well? 
Um, so the possibility result um, presented here says that absent further assumptions, the accuracy on the target is identifiable. Um, if this conditional PT of Y given X is uniquely identified by the information we're assuming we have um, about the labeled source data and unlabeled target data. Um, so the forward direction is uh, pretty concise to show. Um, the forward direction just being if this conditional is uniquely identified, then accuracy is identifiable. Um, you can kind of see this because this expectation over here, um, we already assumed we have access to this um, distribution of the unlabeled data. Um, now, if we have like this uniquely identified PT of Y given X, we can fully understand um, the joint distribution of X and Y in the target domain um, and use that to get um, a measure of uh, error in the target domain as this expectation. Um, the reverse direction is a bit harder to show. Um, but generally it proceeds as a proof by contradiction. So we're trying to prove um, that if accuracy is identifiable, then this conditional is uniquely identifiable. Um, so they start by assuming that this conditional is not uniquely identified um, and then show with like this artificial construction that you can find an example of a classifier that estimates different target accuracies. Um, and also that it's sort of impossible to tell um, with this classifier, like which error corresponds to which target conditional. Um, so together, this just pr provides some sort of bounds on um, what we can what we can do in this space. Um, so I wanted to also just give some examples of like, what does um, PT of Y given X, what could that look like? Um, what does it mean to like uniquely identify it? Um, so here are two like really uh, common examples from the literature. Um, one being covariate shift and the other being label shift. Um, so covariate shift just says that um, conditioning on like a distribution of X, um, the distribution of the labels um, between the source and the target domains um, are the same and then sort of flipped for, for label shift. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, we can uniquely identify this, this error, this accuracy, um, because as we're trying to, you know, use this expectation, um, over uh, the joint distribution of X and Y over the target domain, um, we can recover that um, by sort of reweighting the terms, um, given that we know this joint of PS of X and Y. Um, and then because we can factor um, this joint probability um, into like the, the marginal and the conditional, um, the conditional we kind of know is, is equal, we basically can uh, cancel out terms in the numerator denominator um, to get an expression like this. Um, and so since we know that we already know PT of X and we know PS of X, um, we can recover the accuracy. Um, and something very similar holds in the case of label shift. Um, so the related result is this impossibility result that kind of proceeds directly from like the proof by contradiction that I just um, went through earlier. Um, it says that absent assumptions on the classifier, absent assumptions, um, you know, additional information on the conditional, um, there's no method of estimating accuracy that will work for every type of shift. Um, so we showed earlier um, in the contradiction that there were these two different target conditionals um, that led to two different indistinguishable error estimates. Um, so unless we could like rule out that particular like artificially constructed classifier that couldn't tell the difference um, or have like additional information on what kinds of classifiers we have, um, for example, in general, like if we have a method that estimates accuracy perfectly in like covariate shift, it might not necessarily um, perfectly estimate accuracy under cases of label shift. Um, so in general, um, they say that identifying the accuracy of the classifier is just as hard as identifying the optimal predictor. Um, so those are some bounds on um, kind of what we can discover in this space. Um, sort of now moving on to just how this confidence is um, calculated. So I mentioned that um, the output of these classifier, these logits, these logits are being fed into score functions. Um, two types of score functions are tested um, in this paper, um, one being maximum confidence and the other being negative entropy. Um, I think they got better results slightly um, with negative entropy. Um, and then generally they calculate this threshold um, just mathematically saying again that um, the expected number um, in, the, in the source set of um, examples that have a score under the threshold 
um, is equal to the expected error um, in the source distribution. Um, and then at test time, when we have like um, the score function, we have a calibrated threshold. Um, then for like each example, we can um, get its score and see if it's below or above the threshold um, and give a guess then if it's um, incorrectly or correctly classified. Um, and generally, this um, method actually showed um, really promising results in the empirical evaluation. Um, but kind of like before we um, talk about those results, um, they also presented this toy model to kind of illustrate um, some of the theoretical guarantees um, already mentioned earlier, um, just to also give like practical examples of when this will succeed and when this will fail. Um, so to keep things simple, they work with a binary classification problem. Um, the X uh, basically has just two features. One is invariant and is um, perfectly predictive um, of the label Y. Um, Y could be either one or zero. And then we have this other spurious feature. Um, and what this line basically says here um, is that in the source distribution, um, like the X, uh, the spurious feature and the invariant feature um, can have like the same sign can be like the spurious feature can look like it's predictive of the label um, with some probability um, PSP. Um, and in the target domain, um, this probability is sort of changed. So basically um, the amount of spurious correlation um, is what's shifting between the source and target domains. Um, and then for, for the, the um, to generate the data, um, for, for each, uh, either if it's label of one or label of zero, um, they draw these X data from this uniform distribution. Um, and then they try to learn this max margin classifier. Um, and they generally uh, reference previous literature that showed that um, this type of classifier will rely somewhat on the spurious feature. Um, so we're not expecting you know, perfect accuracy in this setting. Um, so to like illustrate, um, kind of the, the exact numbers that they used um, for this empirical section for the toy model. Um, so the, the uniform distribution, for example, for the positive data, um, it's generated uniformly from 0.1, the margin up to 10. Um, and then for the negative data um, from negative 0.1 to negative 10. Um, and then for example, for all the positive uh, examples um, shown in blue, um, the invariant features are all positive because um, y equals one, um, but then like sort of the, the distribution of the uh, spurious feature um, varies according to, to that probability that I talked about earlier. Um, so they tested it in two different target domains with two different amounts of like spurious correlation. Um, and then also just show like um, in general for a max margin classifier um, with more data, you can better learn the margin, which in this case is 0.1. Um, so with this exact setup, um, this toy model, they were able to show that the difference between the um, average thresholded confidence, which is the, the metric that's presented in this paper, um, the ATC estimated target error, and the true target error is provably bounded with a certain probability. Um, this is just to say that like um, in the ideal case, we would be able to say that the um, ATC estimate and the true target error are exactly the same all of the time. Um, but this guarantee just says that um, these S the estimate is close to the target error most of the time. Um, so that's kind of like a theoretical guarantee. Um, however, if we like just change this toy model slightly um, and instead shift the support of the target class conditional, meaning um, we would reduce the value of C here. So basically all of um, this X generated data will be in the uniform distribution, like much closer um, to the margin. Um, so then what they show here is this plot of true accuracy versus predicted accuracy with the ATC metric um, and shows that uh, ATC is essentially like overestimating its confidence. Um, and I think like the intuition here is that, um, you know, this, this threshold and these scores um, are kind of like taking into account that um, the scores um, or like the, the magnitude of like the, the invariant feature um, could be usually very far um, from the margin in the source distribution. It could be up to 10. Um, but then in the target, they kind of like switch that so that it's um, could be very close um, to the margin. 
Um, so in those cases, you want to be much more careful um, about distinguishing between positive and negative examples. Um, but the threshold that was um, calibrated on the source data um, is not as uh, sensitive. Um, so the result is that it sort of becomes a little bit overconfident. Um, so that's kind of like the intuition um, and also just illustrates the possibility and impossibility results more concretely. Um, great. So like now on to like the empirical evaluation um, and like the real world data sets that are used in practice. Um, so they like tried a bunch of different shifts and a bunch of different data sets. Um, synthetic shifts like adding noise to CFAR and MNIST, um, synthetic shifts from visual corruptions um, like lens distortions, um, natural shifts in the data collection process, um, also these other data sets where they had like artistic renditions of object classes. Um, and the, but the two most like important um, types of shifts are no novel subpopulations. Um, where you see like uh, this breeds data set is basically like a, a hierarchy sort of, of like classes and subclasses. Um, so if you introduce like novel subclasses um, at test time, you know, what was the performance look like then? Um, as well as distribution shifts faced in the wild. Um, an example of this would be like if you're trying to predict something related to um, molecular structure, um, there might be certain like symmetries or invariances that hold in this domain. Um, so it's an example of like distributions found in the wild. Um, so yeah, for the methodology for each data set, um, they like fixed a certain model um, that they were going to train. Um, it's the same in the source and target distributions. Um, that's kind of the list of uh, models uh, for each data set. Um, they trained using benchmarked hybrid parameters. They were just trying to get like really good performance because their focus was on the distribution shift. Um, and the comparison evaluation um, was done via uh, mean absolute estimation error, so just the absolute um, average difference between the true accuracy um, and the uh, estimated accuracy. Um, for comparison, there are like other metrics that um, so far were state of the art in the literature. Um, average confidence and difference of confidence um, ended up being kind of like the, the most uh, important uh, for this evaluation. Um, kind of going just directly into like a summary of results. Um, so on the left, you can kind of see um, the different data sets. Um, and then the uh, mean average absolute error was uh, scaled relative to uh, average confidence, the um, orange crosses. Um, so those are uh, scaled to be a uh, estimation error of one, and then everything else is uh, shown relative to that. Um, so a smaller value is better. Um, you can generally see that the ATC metrics um, are like outperforming all of the other uh, state-of-the-art metrics. Um, so for some other um, evaluation, so here, um, basically every data point that you see here um, is a different out of distribution data set. Um, and so for, for each of those data sets, um, they evaluated um, you know, predicted accuracy versus true out of distribution accuracy um, using like three different metrics, um, difference of confidences, um, GDE, and then uh, average, threshold, average thresholded confidence, which was ours. Um, and if it's closer to like the diagonal uh, black dotted line, the better it is. Um, and you generally see um, for these like two or three practical data sets um, that like the line of best fit um, for all of these uh, uh, graphed uh, predicted versus actual uh, accuracies, um, ATC was, was superior. Um, so the other like result um, was that uh, the types of data sets where we saw like um, kind of the most uh, struggle in performance um, or improvement, less perform improvement um, with ATC over the previous state of the art um, is in like data sets found in the wild, um, as well as like novel subpopulations. Um, those were like the hardest to, to estimate confidences for. Um, so here we kind of just like see like a deeper dive into, into that. Um, you can see here in blue, like different subpopulations. Um, they're like more overconfident um, about uh, the predicted accuracy versus what they, um, what the true predicted accuracy should be. Um, using a uh, difference of confidences, they also um, looked into like, if we could improve um, the predicted accuracy score, if we did some uh, fine tuning with some labels. 
Um, and with fine tuning with some labels, you can see that the performance um, is much closer to uh, ATC. Um, and lastly, here on the right, you can kind of see the results for the for the toy example where ATC is um, clearly superior. Um, so yeah, so this paper um, presents like a lot of theoretical foundations. Um, future work will kind of extend the toy model into multi-class and better understand the efficacy of like calibration and other related metrics um, to kind of boost performance. Um, and just like generally going beyond um, the theoretical model, uh, the, the toy model, um, to understand like, okay, we, we have these um, impossibility and possibility results here, um, but are there ways to, um, you know, boost performance on the particular types of distribution shifts that we see in practice? Um, and in particular, improve performance on data sets with novel subpopulations. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you today. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Catherine.